Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. I am so happy to welcome my guest today, Maureen St. Germain. Maureen is known as the Practical Mystic and is a transformational in international teacher and author of Beyond the Flower of Life and Waking Up in the 5D. She provides tools to guide people in the transition from the third dimension to the joy and love of the fifth dimension. Her interest in the Gay Akashic Records resulted in her being granted access to this dimension that has been off limits to most of humanity for millions of years. I am so happy to have you as our guest today, Maureen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. It, it's a delight to get to know you both so well. well. I'm, th I'm thrilled to have you. Um, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up on a farm in uh, central Ohio and in, in just south of Cleveland. And uh, I was always looking to the sky. I loved having the planes fly over our house. We were in the flight path. And as a child, I was very, very intuitive. Uh, I knew things that no one else knew. And growing up Catholic, we had this beautiful book, a gold bound um, Lives of the Saints, kind of like a giant dictionary. And I would always pull it out and look at it. And um, one day it wasn't in the cupboard where it was supposed to be in that bookcase. So I, I remember looking for it thinking, well, I wonder where it is. Because I always put it back. And I saw that it was in a closet on a high shelf. So I got a chair from the kitchen and stood on the chair and got the book out, um, you know, did whatever I wanted to do, look at reading or looking up. And then I put it back in the bookcase where it belonged. And I remember thinking, I'm putting it back where it belongs. And I'm sure my mother, who was worried about the gold leaf, you know, being worn off by a child being, uh, you know, manhandling her book, um, she never hid it from me again. <laughs> so I've had uh, that gift and my mother was very intuitive as well. Um, <clears throat> she saw my father uh, when he was a prisoner of war and where he was. And it, it, it made her, what's the word I want? It reassured her that he was still alive, but it scared her, you know, because it was information she wasn't expecting when it came in in kilometers. Um, you know, back then people didn't think in kilometers at all. Um, I uh, led a pretty normal life, got married, have four children, they're all grown, and uh, have always been interested in spiritual things. So I began my spiritual study from the time I was a teenager and began uh, studying the Edgar Casey work. I joined an Edgar Casey study group and then studied with the Ascended Master teachings and the Essenes um, and continued to study and grow. And then I began teaching the Flower of Life work which just transformed everything. The, the energy field of the Merkaba changes everything. And I really like opened up and huge energy came through. Lots of information, lots of stuff. And I taught in 24 cities all over the world, 24 countries rather, and uh, more, way more than 24 cities, 24 countries. And um, began writing uh, about my experiences in the book Beyond the Flower of Life, uh, which is set for a re-release in, um, this spring, uh, and it'll be the 12th, 12 year anniversary, and it's sold very, very well, and so it's being edited and you know, re released. And then um, I wrote uh, the book Waking Up in 5D, which has really helped people begin to understand that the 5D experience isn't just um, you know, flipping from, like flipping on a switch. I see it more like a sine wave, you know, like kids grow up and they do something mature and then they do something stupid, then they do something mature like that. That's us. And so then after that, I wrote the book, uh, The Akashic Records, and both of these books have won awards. Um, and I teach people how to open the Akashic Records and how to work in the field. And I include a lot of supplemental um, tools working in the Akashic Records that isn't available in any other coursework. So everybody who's doing this work is doing awesome work. I want to be really clear about that. But um, I've been given gifts to teach, and I'm happy to share them. Well, we're very happy that you're doing that. I want to go back to you mentioned the Makaba. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, it's an energetic field that um, you build around the body or you turn on around the body. Most people are familiar with this shape that's called the Merkaba, and it's a uh, two nested 
tetrahedrons, we call it a star tetrahedron, and the actual field that you turn on is three of these that are spinning, you know, counter rotating, and then one that doesn't spin. And it's a very powerful field that allows a person to carry the energy of the fifth dimension. So even if you haven't earned it, you've put on the uniform of being an evolved citizen, and you end up making choices and seeing uh, uh, from a point of unconditional love, which helps you really make very powerful, useful, helpful choices in your own life path. Well, how do you turn that on? Um, it's through a guided meditation that takes five minutes, and it takes about a minimum of four or five hours to learn because you want to learn all the geometry behind it. And you only need to learn that part once. So even if geometry is not your thing, the way I teach it, people have told me that they, if they had me as their geometry teacher, they would have gotten it right away. So I, I teach how to integrate it and also why it's, why it's so valuable because it's directly related to our DNA, our body system, the way the joints and the bones work. And once you begin to get that, you go, oh, it's tuned to us. And then once you realize that, then it's easy to go, okay, I get it. And then it's in, and you don't have to think about it after that. And then you just use the codes to activate it through the breath work. And um, the whole breath, it's 17 breaths, uh, takes maybe five minutes to do. And within a, a relatively short period of time, it becomes permanent. So you try and do it every day until it becomes permanent. The field lasts for 24, 48 hours. But at some point, the body just goes, okay, this is who I am. This is my new me. And that then becomes a very powerful tool because you begin to see things before they happen. You begin to understand things that other people don't understand. You hear people talking and they're really just thinking. So it, it literally opens up all the channels without, again, without having earned it. And what I mean by earning it is, you know, some people have a gift and then they just kind of learn how to manage it. Other people can learn to do what you do, for example, but they have to work at it because they didn't have that gift that's naturally there. But with your guidance and help, they can find their way and begin to do that. And with practice, they can get there. Just like some people are natural at the piano and other people practice a lot and get just as good. Can you do a portion of that or the, the meditation with us now? Or do we have to study the sacred geometry in order for you to do that? Well, opening the Akashic Records is a sacred practice. So, so this is part of the Akashic Records, oh, the Merkaba? Oh, excuse me. I said that backwards. I shifted on you. Sorry. Um, the Merkaba meditation is a 17 breath meditation. And I could, I could possibly ask for that energy to be implanted in you. But for me to take you through the steps, it wouldn't make sense to you because I'm doing certain mudras and holding a breath a certain way. And it is a bit of jargon in the sense that, you know, you inhale, exhale, and hold on exhale or, or hold on empty and things like that, that we try to get people to really get. But once you get it, it's, it's kind of like learning yoga. You could follow along with a teacher, but you wouldn't really get the benefit unless they taught you the poses. Can people learn that from your books? Do you just describe that in your books? No. I have a DVD that gives wow. them pictures. Even better. <laughs> Even better, yeah. So I have a DVD to teach them the Merkaba. And uh, then I also have a, a call out meditation so that the, the you know, actual steps are called out for you. So you don't have to remember anything. You just have to you know, kind of get it in your head. Just like when you go to a yoga teacher practice, you, know, you show up for you know, yoga or whatever. If they say down dog, you know exactly what to do. You know that pose. But if you didn't know that pose and someone said, do down dog, you're going, what is that? Right. I get that. You also mentioned the Akashic Records. Mm. Um, for people in my audience who don't know what that is, can you explain that to us, please? The easy way to imagine the Akashic Records is to think of it as a library, but it is alive. So um, what it means is this is a field of living energy that holds the past, present and the possible and probable futures. And the reason I word it that way is because you can see into what you have done and why things are the way they are. You can see what your, your relationships are and what has happened around them. And you can also see why you act or react the way you do. 
for example, in one reading, a client was told right out of the gate. And, and one of the things I do that nobody else does is I start with what's called opening remarks. And we just take a download from the Akashic Records and we announce a bunch of stuff. And a lot of times as a guide, I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But in this case, I could see the woman struggling with her life preserver, the kind you wear when you get on a boat. And um, the record keeper said to her, you don't have to worry about struggling with your, your life vest. Um, you're fine when you're on your boat and you're gonna be fine. And of course she screams at me, how did you know I had a boat? And I, I started to laugh. I said, I didn't know you had a boat. That came from the record keepers. Um, and then at the end, she said, you know, I don't even believe in reincarnation, but if I did, how did I die in a past life? And this is another skill that we teach in the class, and that's how to connect with your higher self. So I checked in. Am I supposed to tell her? Because I don't assume just because she's hired me and just because I can see clearly what that answer is, that I'm supposed to say it because I know it's going to be a shock. And you know exactly what they said. And my guidance was, yes, go ahead and tell her. And she, she just went, and, and then they repeated again what they said in the beginning. You don't have to worry. You're never going to drown again. Um, you'll be fine. Um, in another case that we worked with someone who was in a drowning accident but survived, but everybody knew that it, she wasn't going to live. You know, she was an older woman and it was just a weird scenario. Well, in the work we did behind the scenes, we discovered that she had drowned like 10 times. Three of them were, you know, self-annihilation. You know, four of them were, I'll use the word punishment, where she was forcibly drowned. And the others were accidents. So she had the predisposition to um, take herself out that way. And with the work we did, and we cleared all those negative memories, and I'm sure that's part of the work you do, we, we cleared a lot of that negative energy so she lived a lot longer than she would have if she hadn't had that clearing work and her family was able to say goodbye and they were able to have a, a, a much more peaceful transition for her than would have occurred if she had just drowned outright. Oh, that's wonderful. Very interesting work. And that that's, comes from the Akashic Records and it also comes from the clearing work that we do. So when you talk about the Akashic Records, and some people may know it as the Book of Life, correct? Yes, because that's what Edgar Cayce called it. And it's also called the Book of Life in the Old Testament. And, and when Edgar Cayce, the famous American uh, mystic and seer, he was asked, where is this information coming from? He said it's coming from the Akashic Records and the... Uh, person's own field. And then he was asked, well, what are the Akashic Records? And he was told, well, it's the Book of Life that is known in the Old Testament. And what we want to understand is when we go to the records, we don't actually go inside because it's a living field. And if you or I went in and saw the person we're married to murder us in a previous lifetime, we might not be so kindly to the person we're married to after that. So, and also the, all that energy of seeing that might change the field so we're at the edge and we're working with what we call guides or record keepers. And then we are communicating back and forth in that zone, but it's very fluid, very, very fluid, very, you know, like one of the things that one of my students said one time, he says, I'm so amazed that when I open to the records, the information just comes. He says, I, I keep thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna to say to this person. And then we open their records and it just comes out of my mouth. It's very cool. So you talk about the past. So the records talk about the past, the present and the future. Yes, possible and probable futures. And the way to think about that is to say, okay, um, I'm a high school student and I'm thinking about going to college. I've got two or three applications in, you know, I've got two that I can't decide. If I get in both of them, I'm gonna have to sort it out. So at some point they're thinking about these two, those two are in the records. Maybe once they go to that first one, they make a decision, they go to that school, then they think, oh, I made a bad decision. So they're still holding both of those in their field. Then if they drop out of the first one and move to the second one, then that becomes solid. And the other one has a short memory, but not a big one. All those other ones that they applied to that they thought about, but didn't really give, that generally fades away and does not have a big thread. But there are times that we're so conflicted about a decision that we actually move into both of them at the same time and we have double timelines. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a layer on top of a layer, dimensional. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, can the Akashic Records predict what's in store for 2021? Well, you know, um, I wouldn't say that they predict exactly because free will is a big player and they, the records themselves hold some information where we're headed, but
but they don't necessarily have big, big stuff. So, you know, I have done predictions for 2021 and I, I, um, I do have a pretty good idea of how things are going to play out. Um, Can you share that with us? Well, I think the biggest thing is it's going to be a big year of big, big change. Big, big change. We're going to see a big change in how we interact with each other because once we stop being, you know, stuck in our homes all the time, we're going to be much more uh, appreciative of one another. A lot of businesses that have gone out of business, big companies and little companies, something's going to take their place and it isn't going to be identical. It's going to be something more and evolved. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I saw on the cover of Wired magazine, email is dead. And I thought, whoa, what does that mean? But now I can see it. Now we're moving to text, you know, just get in and get out. Um, so that, you know, that, that's one big, big change. And then there's other changes that I see. Um, I do see that uh, leadership is going to be a lot more different than it is. We're going to see more honesty in leadership. Right now, we're trying to be honest, but it's hard. You know, I mean, if you're trying to hide something that you did in the past, you're going to have trouble being honest. So one of the things that's going to happen is everybody, big companies, little companies, and people, are going to figure out, it's just going to be simple to tell the truth. Yeah, I had an affair. I figured out that that was a bad idea. I haven't seen this person in two years. Every once in a while, they try to reach me, and I blow them off. And I'm really sorry that that happened, but it made me a better spouse because I recognize how valuable my relationship with is. And I know this hurts to find out, but I'm doing the best I can here. That kind of level of honesty is hard to come by, you know, because if we've done something that we're ashamed of, it's hard to be open about it. But you see it a little bit in politics even now, where a politician will say, you know, I did this. I know I shouldn't have. I'm really sorry. I'm recognizing my mistake. You know, I won't do it again or something like that. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, we're going to see breaking down of all the structures that we counted on. So the way we operate is going to change. And I'm not exactly sure how that's going to play out. But what I see is the systems and the structures that we have, for lack of a better word, become comfortable with are going to take on a new form. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so old established ways of doing things are just going to evaporate. And this was a year of letting go of that. You know, it's kind of like if you're used to doing things a certain way, you always do it that way and you don't want it to change. And I'll give you a funny story. You know, when I first married my second husband and I was um, saving uh, the goat cheese in the wrapper a certain way, he says, we do it this way. And I remember growling at him and saying, um, do you want to do this? <laughs> and um, so, you know, it's a simple thing, but what is happening is that everybody is more sovereign everyone is stepping into their power a little bit better and they're able to express how they feel instead of just you know acquiescing or rolling over but that's going to cause a, a rumble and you know sometimes earthquakes or domino effect because if you're the person that's always been controlling things and suddenly your partner is saying well i don't like doing it that way anymore i want to do it my way and you're thinking but this has always worked you see you're going to have that kind of a interaction um, and finally, uh, we're going to see more experts who are self-educated. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people like me, people like you, you know, we didn't go to school to get a degree in being a mystic or being an Akasha Records guide, although we might have gone to, through training. There's not, no official, you're not the doctor of mystic or you're not the doctor of Akasha Records like that. Well, that's very interesting. Well, I hope that you know, because of all that has gone on this year, that it's not just texting how people communicate because we really do need the social interaction. And I think that's a big problem in society is that we have a generation of kids who don't know how to interact one-on-one. -on -one. They're used to hiding behind the computer. So I, well, I think, yeah, I think that that's a really good point because um, I think once we come out of our houses and come out of lockdown, we're going to actually decide we want more people, we want more people in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I did on a presentation I did last night was I said, you know, go on, when you go on vacation, consider inviting extended family. 
you know, grandma, grandpa, cousins, relatives, whatever, because that will allow you to have a bigger connection. It also makes really yummy memories because when there's more people who are related, there's lots of, you know, different kinds of interaction, which is very, very interesting and fun. So you talk about mysticism and you've been called a modern day mystic. What, what is that? And are we all mystics? Um, um, probably we're all mystics at some level. And uh, the practical mystic, as I'm called, it's sometimes called the modern day mystic, but the practical mystic has to do with the fact that as a mom, as a corporate person, as a, a spiritually focused individual, I found ways that everyday people could use tools to uh, benefit how they operate, to benefit their life. And that that would open up, make, make the skills that are available to them, if they would work at it a little bit, improve their life dramatically. You know, there's a great story on, on one of my blog posts um, from November, where I was coming back from teaching in China, and I had made an arrangement with my husband to go to, from San Diego, to go to Los Angeles to a concert, because one of my friends was going to be at this Los Angeles museum. And the concert was in the evening and we figured we would go to LACMA early and, and you know, get lunch and tour around and then, you know, stay for the concert. And the night before I leave to, to fly, my husband comes up with this so-called brilliant idea that we should go to another museum first thing in the morning so we could get two museums instead of one. And I thought that was a terrible idea and I told him so. <laughs> Excuse me. And he said, uh, and I said, you know, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, evoke guilt, right? I didn't even know I was doing this, but I'm telling you now I can observe. I was trying to get the guilt card going. And, um, you know, I'm going to be off a, on a plane for 15 hours. You know, I'm going to be exhausted. I want to sleep in, blah, blah, blah. And he uh, just kind of listened. And as soon as I got off my little pulpit, I then said, but I'll check in with my higher self. And if my higher self says I should do it, I'll do it. Well, all kinds of cool things happened. I met someone that was a family friend from Ohio. Randomly, it's, it's a great story. You got to go to the blog to read it. Um, I ended up inviting them to stay in my New York apartment because I wasn't there all the time. They had, it turns out they had two daughters that were going to school in New York. So it was very helpful to them. Then one of their daughters went to work for me and was the best assistant I ever had. And then when she couldn't work for me, I had another assistant that worked even longer was her friend that she referred. I never had to do any interviews. All this because I was willing to do something I didn't want to do. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Would you say that was almost a little bit of a manifestation? Oh yeah, because I put it out there that I needed a, a new assistant at one point and that mm -hmm. you know I was, I was open to do what my higher self guided me. And that's, that's the thing about this higher self connection that I teach in all my classes, it's in all my books. And it's so powerful because it's a very 3D tool. It's very, you know, like I worked in the corporate world and, you know, we had to have proof and, and steps and like that. And so I developed a way to connect with your higher self that you do these three things and you will be able to connect with your higher self and have accuracy. You won't have to trust your higher self. You will know your higher self. Just like we trust that we'll have this great radio show, but we know the sun's going to come up tomorrow. You know, I think what's really important, so um, I wrote a book called Conversations with Mary. I communicate with Mary. And one of the things she repeats over and over again is to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's so many people out there who do things that are very complicated and very hard, as you say, for the average person to follow. I think for anybody to follow. You know, if you put too much on your plate from that wonderful buffet, it overwhelms you. So just to keep it very, very, very simple. And I think what you're saying is, you know, three steps, you know, you can do this and then it becomes routine. It's your comfort zone. You bring it forward is very, very, very important. You know, um, I think we're all trying to speak to humanity in a way that we can raise the vibration um, in a way that is just simple. Like I say, just go to the supermarket and say hello to somebody, you know, thank the guy who's packing your groceries and ask him how his day is, like simple things like that. Do you agree with that? 
Absolutely. In fact, I, I even go um, to the place where when we're driving and we see a traffic accident or any kind of, you know, police pulling over, we call in the angels to help yeah. the policeman and the driver. And if it's an accident, you know, to help all the players, the paramedics, the person who might have been needing uh, assistance. Um, and that's just a cue to help, to help me, remind me, hey, I could say a little prayer for those people and call on the angels. So yeah, I, I totally agree. And there's so many little things we could do. And one of the little things that I teach people is very, very powerful. And I learned this by accident, like a lot of things. That's why I call myself the practical mystic, because even though that's what I was called in this book, you know, the practical mystic, it still is quite interesting to me how it all plays out. So the, the simple thing is, I'm asking for a day of heaven on earth for me and everyone I come in contact with. And what that does is changes the vibe for me. So I'm walking in like they've got fairy dust, fairy dust all around me. And everybody who gets close to me gets a little of that fairy dust. And so the interactions are always very high and very positive. And we all know, you know, like when you call the bank or, you, you know, you have some kind of interaction where you've got to sort something out and you feel bad, you, um, you kind of go in with like you're growling or, you know, scowling because you're unhappy about something. And when you, when you set the tone and you announce every day, at least once a day, I'm asking for a day of heaven on earth. So heaven on earth is the equivalent of 5D. And that's why it's so powerful because it just changes the vibe. And the first time I did it, I had this amazing experience where everything just flowed. And I had a flood in my basement. I had to catch a flight. I had to call the repairman. I had to, you know, fix the flood. Everything worked. Everything came together. It was so amazing. And I, I'm sitting on the plane looking around going, how the heck did I pull that off? And I was told, well, you asked for a day of heaven on earth. So then I thought, whoa, next time I have a chock block day, I'm going to do that again. The second time I did it, I thought, wait a minute. I don't have to wait till the day's chock a block. I can ask this every day. And so can so can anyone. Yeah, I, I firmly believe that, you know, people very often feel unworthy and mm. they look to those who have the platform, you know, like us, to speak to spirituality as almost their gurus. And we're not gurus, we're just no. people, just That's like right. them. And we're all worthy, you know. Um, it's about taking stock and responsibility of who you are, raising your own vibration in, in whatever way, if that means being kind and compassionate, con connecting to the angels, to God, to whatever you believe in, you can bring it forward and you can claim every day as your own heaven on earth. And all those experiences that are horrible, they're all learning. It's learning that some things just don't matter. You know, like, you know, it's, it's looking at it and saying, I was so upset about X, Y, and Z, but really? in the scheme of things, did that matter? And I think that's what COVID is teaching us as well. Like what really matters in, in our lives? And you know, the ability to hold that within ourselves. And like you said, like the fairy dust, it's contagious. You know, um, when you raise your vibration or you bring in heaven, it's contagious. And again, it can be simple. Like my kids laugh at me, you know, because I always get a parking a parking parking spot at the front of the supermarket or wherever I'm going because I just say okay come on angels I don't like to walk too far I don't want to <laughs> <be> <laughs> like like just put me close I'm in a rush like everybody else unfortunately you know right. it's doing little things like that and having a sense of humor around it it doesn't have to be so humdrum you know, you don't need to be sitting in a church chanting, although that's wonderful. You know, you could be sitting in your car. Like I said, you know, everybody should talk to their relatives, you know, talk to them. You'll get the messages loud and clear if you just open yourself up and raise yourself up. So, um, well, you know, I, I'd like to touch on two things that you said. One was that, you know, everyone is worthy. And unfortunately, so many people have been led to believe that they're not worthy by what they were taught as a child, mm -hmm. maybe even inadvertently, you know, by well-meaning parents or caregivers that have said something to them. And so how do you figure out that you're worthy? And the answer is you don't have to figure it out. You try it out. So if you're worthy, you know that if you call the angels, they'll come. 
But if you don't think you're worthy, you won't call the angels because you don't think you're worthy. But if somebody like you or me says, look, just do it and, and sign up and say, okay, I'm calling the angels for help. or I'm asking for this or I'm asking for this. If, if you get what you were asking for, then you know you're worthy. So it's almost like fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other thing you said was, um, does it really matter? And I was given a really wonderful example of this when I was uh, quite a bit younger. And I was working as the head of tourism for a city. And we had volunteers manning our visitor center. <clears throat> and it was Sunday morning and the volunteer we had did not have a ride. And I had agreed that I would pick her up and take her to the visitor center so she could open it up. And I'm busy with my kids, you know, I'm having a wonderful Sunday morning and all of a sudden I went, oh my God, I'm supposed to go take that guy, that lady to the visitor center. So I hopped in my car and I picked her up probably an hour late and she was still waiting patiently and I was so apologetic and she said the same thing you said. She said, you know what, honey, 10 years from now it won't matter. Don't even give it a thought. Yeah. And, and I, I was so absolved of my quote guilt. So that's the other thing. Guilt is only good for two things. It's good to help you decide to be different and to recognize that you could be different. Yeah. That's it. Very different. And, you know, and, and to just to wrap up this worthy stuff, um, you know, when I was writing conversations with Mary, Mary said, you know, you don't have to beg. You don't have to say, please, 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 or, you know, trade it off. And, you know, um, right. make a contract. As, right. as a Catholic, I felt like I was raised to, not be worthy and to beg oh please oh please god you know that side of thing but to pray instead by thank you for allowing this to come into my world claim it you know it's 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 a manifestation in itself and it's putting out an intention by any other words okay but it's also saying i am so worthy that i know that this will come my way that this prayer, this conversation, this uh, what I want, what I think I need will come my way. Um, so I think that you know it's it's all about it's all about being preconditioned, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of changing and changing that up. But I think that you know um, more the words that come out of our mouths to people, hopefully they hear us because that's the way the world's going to change, and we need the change. We're going into a new normal now. Mm -hmm. you know, and it needs to change. So, well, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I hope to speak to you more in the future. Um, and to everyone today, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment, and be sure to subscribe to our channels so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much. Be well. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Anna.